All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's now 618, and we're going to commence the meeting. If you haven't already found your seat, please do so. Would someone please encourage the folks back near the food line to join us? So welcome to the final meeting of the 2019 season for Sempty New York. We'll be having a meeting today, as you all know, about ST2110. Can you hear me? Okay. ST2110 video over IP, and we'll have a, a working system and get into some very practical considerations today at this meeting. As always, I'd like to thank our sponsors, our sustaining sponsors, the studio at B&H Photo, and also the now 48 sustaining sponsors who support us every year. Please patronize those sponsors. If you are not currently a sponsor and you operate a business in our industry, please consider becoming a sponsor. It's very inexpensive, and this section is now self-sustaining financially with uh, our sponsor's assistance. It's been a great success as a program, and we no longer uh, are a burden on the national headquarters of SEMTI financially. So uh, Carl Cavagnolo, who was here, uh, is now in charge of uh, fundraising for this year, and uh, his contact information is on the screen in front of you, so feel free to capture that information and reach out to Carl regarding sponsorships, or any member of the board, we're all here. In terms of membership, I know we have at least 30 or 40 non-members here tonight. Uh, if you uh, look at the badges on the folks to your left and your right, you will note whether they are current members or non-members, guests. If you're standing and sitting next to a guest, please engage them in conversation and encourage them to become more active in SEMPTI. Become members, go to the website, join up, uh, make it part of your professional career. Uh, Wes added this slide for me. <laughs> Uh, just noting that the uh, 2019 Technical Conference is uh, now scheduled in October, and uh, there are booth spaces available for vendors and exhibitors. C. Wes, who is here, and you'll, he'll be speaking, and he's tonight's producer, he's right here, uh, if you need more details about the annual Technical Conference. And then finally, uh, we have our Board of Managers meeting coming up this week, and in this June meeting, it's the meeting where we determine the schedule for next year. Uh, we've been soliciting at each meeting suggestions, and a number have come through. Uh, I put them all into a spreadsheet that you can access here. It's read-only, but you can see what was suggested for last year and what was in this past cycle's uh, schedule. You can now see what's been suggested for this year, and of course nothing's in the cycle yet, but we'll be determining that sometime through June and July as the board meets on this topic. So if you want to send additional suggestions in, that email address, that subject line, and you can see what's already on the docket as suggestions there at that link. At this time, I'm going to introduce Wes Simpson, who's producing tonight's meeting and has done a great job. We have a really good turnout here tonight 
great catering. Thank you, Wes. <laughs> so uh, with no further ado, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks for that introduction. <clears throat> so uh, this meeting has been in the works for a while. Um, I first saw this demo system personally about six months ago and was really impressed. And I think you guys are going to be too. There's a lot of really um, advanced technology. It, it covers all the main aspects of SMPTE 2110. So the last couple of years you've heard me and some other speakers talk about 2110 on a theoretical basis. This is it real. This, this stuff works. It's uh, in production. People are using it today. And um, you're going to see more and more of it as, as time goes on. So I'm very pleased to introduce Carl Paulson, who's the Chief Technology Officer of Diversified. Um, he, um, as Diversified CTO, Carl Paulson provides company-wide emerging technology advising and strategic planning focused on advanced broadcast media system. Carl anchors Diversified's consulting and technology-driven media entertainment engineering services with a focus on technical education, long-term planning, workflow analysis, media asset management, and storage technologies. Carl is a fellow of the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, a life member and certified professional broadcast engineer of SBE, and an active member of the SMPTE standards community. He is also a member of the AES, IEEE, the Video Services Forum, and AIMS. Carl regularly contributes to TV Technology Magazine, and he has published three books on the topics of media asset management and storage. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Carl. Thank you. Again. This is what rehearsals do, right? Well, good evening. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Wes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in New York City. Um, I travel all over this country, uh, not only with this kit, but for the, for the company. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge. And uh, what you're actually going to see here, as Wes said, simply get the slide up, just pause for a second here, is Something that we put together in the company uh, at Diversified as an educational tool. We recognized a long time ago, probably three plus years ago, when we first started building uh, facilities for end users, uh, stadium facilities, uh, the AP facility down here in the financial district, and other locations um, that our own teams of engineers and, and uh, people on the projects were um, not all equal on the education standpoint. And as a result, we were probably spending 20 or 30 percent extra cycles of engineering just learning this in discrete little pools. Um, keep in mind the time frame of this is 2022, 6 and 7 were uh, finished and, and being built. That's about all you could build or an Aspen system. And the 2110 uh, services and systems weren't even finished when we first began uh, this exercise. So we partnered with, uh, first initially with Tektronix and a couple of the other folks we've got to build this kit so that we could learn collectively, not just our side, but both sides of the industry, the manufacturers as well as um, ourselves on what does the standards mean? How are they evolving? What's important? What's coming up next? All of those sorts of things, as, uh, as well as helping our own customers understand the details of the technology. I know over the past we've had uh, several meetings here about the details of the dash 10, dash 20, dash 30, dash 31, dash 40, dash 41, 42, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's not what this session is going to be about. We're going to show you the real working system. But before I get too far into that, and I'm going to um, engage the uh, comparable assistance of Mr. Phil Burnell, who's trying to adjust audio right now. Phil's sort of the keeper of the kit. He keeps this maintained and puts it, assembles it, and, 
uh, allows it to evolve. But uh, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what's happening in this world. Some of this is pretty obvious to, sev to, to several of you, and, and others that may be the first time you're really looking at, why in the world are we doing this? What's this about? So we're all very familiar with the SDI architecture on the left, the routing switcher from an SDI standpoint, the associated VNCs and um, um, XLRs and D9s and D25s and things of that nature. And where we're moving to is what you see on the right-hand side, a collection of SFP and software-based solutions running on COTS hardware, including servers and other components, but the media, the physical media, the layer one or layer zero level of the stack is in essence moving to fiber optics, to SFP-based systems, to multiple fibers in a single connector such as MTPs, and, and still in many cases conventional RJ45 over copper. And we'll explain where some of those things are still prominent even today. So what's happening with this technology collision? Well, it may not be quite obvious, but we've never before in the history of our endeavors changed the direction of broadcast infrastructures to such a degree as we have so far. This is completely altering the traditional media structures that we've been living with for probably the last 30 plus years. We're also having to adopt internet technologies and moving them towards the transports of high bit rate, HBR, professional media in real time over a managed network. And those three statements are very important to understand. This is not pro AV, this is not AV over IP, this is not compressed television like IPTV, this is true studio quality video, audio, and data running at wire speeds in some cases on the SFPs on a managed network and in real time. So think about what that means to the designers, think of what it means to the end users, and think about what it means as you have to migrate through as technology evolves. You can't turn this network off. Once you turn it up, it runs. You have to have an alternative method if you're going to do upgrades or changes to the system. So it's really forcing the entire industry to completely alter their thought processes, not just for the design, which is fiber optic based versus coax, not just for the maintenance, which has typically been left to broadcast professionals or in some cases IT professionals running the control systems and to operations. Because once operations gets a handle on how easy and how efficient this becomes, there's where the thinking processes are going to change even greater. There's going to be new workflow, new capabilities, faster implementations, and it could quite honestly be a challenge to what we've been dealing with as we emerge into the cloud itself. So again, never before have we had this much disruption, this much collision, or this much alteration in broadcast media technologies. And that's what this entire standard is about. So how do we address this? It's certainly changing what's going to be called the IT professional of the future. This will be far less than keeping the lights on, so to speak. And um, this is no detriment to what IT does, but IT is a very much a reactionary system in terms of responding to changes and, uh, and aggressively keeping the enterprise itself up, as well as the operational side of it. Um, the whole concept behind doing this is to increase and improve operational efficiencies. Um, we wouldn't do this just because you can do it. There's a vision out there amplified by many of the standards, bodies, and forms and industries, AIMS, for example, that really has an initiative here that will say, if we do this and we do it properly, our efficiencies will improve tremendously. Of course, this creates other issues, such as particularly for the IT professional, and that is we're having to move away from primarily manual configurations. This isn't about a couple hundred IPTV channels that might be distributed or desktop editing systems that might have edit suites or a couple hundred edit platforms. This is about thousands of signals, inputs and outputs, that have to be put together and managed continuously, and that's just not possible manually. So a lot of what's happening in the standards work is not just the, the transport infrastructure, but also the automation and the operational infrastructure itself by organizations such as the AMWA and the Video Services Forum. 
So the future will be for the IT professional to deal with um, automated and managed networks as opposed to manually configured networks. That's where some of the software-defined networking comes into place. Well, the other side of the coin is the broadcast engineers. They're obviously becoming less and less built, uh, dependent upon purpose-built boxes. The black boxes of the past are, are uh, shrinking and condensing down to single or two rack unit servers and switch components. Um, this will be more about leveraging storage and video servers and software control systems. It'll be about maintaining networks with continued delivery, as I said, at wire speed and maximizing the throughputs on every switch port in a system, less the overhead and less protection capability. It's also about managing networks that service multiple protocols with mixed signal types and an engineered topology type of infrastructure. So let's look at this a little bit from a graphics perspective or a graphical perspective. Today we typically have the, tip, the traditional broadcast person or the traditional broadcast sector of the industry. We have media workflows which includes storage and asset management and editing and so forth. And then we have IP networking. That's the interconnection of these devices but it's also the control of those devices in many cases such as a broadcast automation system. So what's happening? They're converging. They're not only converging, they're overlapping in capabilities. And my, vent, my bet is that the center part, which is all about networking, is going to get larger and larger to possibly filling out the 90th percentile of these uh, spheres. So while we're dealing with this, we also have all of these new types of networks. And this is just current um, implementations and practices. We have real-time IP networks, which is what we have here. Non-real-time networking systems, that's the file transport from storage platforms and into um, um, edit stations or asset management systems and archives. We have file-based workflows, the typical editing platforms that are in news and production and so forth. And then, of course, we have cloud solutions. And again, every one of these in some form touch the networking environment. So if you look at this as to where we're going and how many different concoctions of each of these outside bubbles um, are, you have these things to consider. While all of this is going on, we have things like SDR and HDR. We have higher frame rates, and we have 4K and 8K resolutions, all of which are far more easy to do in an IP environment than they are in current SDI type of environments. We have the hybrid workflows, which, are, which go beyond just disaster recovery or storage because they're going to be more consistently used. We actually have been building facilities for the last year or so that are delivering 10 gig to desktops sitting around in an edit environment or a newsroom, all different places. Why? Because they don't know what's coming around the corner from a production standpoint or from a need standpoint. So those are the things that are pretty obvious and obviously we're, we're uh, dealing with cot solutions as opposed to purpose-built primary uh, and proprietary boxes. Um, things are converging and things are combining and by the way there's also this uh, looming technology called ATSD 3.0, which is, um, f from what we're reading recently, probably going to happen and happen faster than we think. But often the far corner is sort of the elephant in the room sorts of things that we also have to deal with, and that is the security, the vulnerability to the systems, how we document these facilities. You're not going to be doing single line drawings where every single line in the drawing shows a particular signal flow itself, like we have done for decades. We're going to be seeing drawings that are basically used by, at least by companies like our, ourselves as system integrators, is to do the physical connections of devices and maybe some flows uh, in, in a very broad state. But most of these control systems and most of these uh, other media flow systems are going to be automated. So you're going to have to go to a laptop that's, or a screen that's attached to a server which looks at all the signal flows in the system, touch something on that screen to identify what's really on that path at that particular moment in time because in an automated environment, it's possible that those systems may change based upon demand and signal flows throughout the whole system. So those are some of the changes, at least that are happening at the physical and the equipment and the system side. But we also have skill sets which are evolving and we're taking to the traditional broadcast engineers and technicians, which have been somewhat isolated or insulated, I guess, from the traditional networking administrators and support engineers and we're doing the same thing. We're combining them together. We're finding that we're going to have a huge overlap, if not a 100% overlap eventually, 
and we're probably going to name this person or this operation uh, a professional broadcast and media network technologist or something akin to that meaning. Probably not that many words, but, but certainly you can see where this is headed. And the questions become out, do you hire an IT engineer and teach them video, or do you hire a video engineer and teach them IT? Well, I think the in some cases, you're going to be doing both, because there's going to be knowledge sets that are going to be proprietary and, and fully familiar to one class of person or function that are going to be different from the other. And I'll give you that example. Here's the expectations and the experience side. The broadcaster's explanation, expectations will still continue. They still have to deal with synchronized and isochronous signals. They have to oper uh, operate in a 24 by 7 by 365 environment. And the reason these are all listed on this side is because this is what the networking people are going to have to understand. In the same way that the networking people who are in used to dealing with, with secure and insulated environments, controlled access, limited access, and standardized and or open uh, platforms, the broadcaster is going to have to understand that as well. And some of the critical ones are the, the no downtime permitted environment. This isn't about being able to go reboot a server or load a piece of software 30 minutes before the start of Super Bowl only to find out, oops, it didn't work. So how many million dollars per second are we now going to lose? That's just not going to happen. Um, they, the, the networking side has to become production sensitive. And they have to understand that both sides of the fence need to have a robust and consistent environment that is manageable and stable across the entire platform. So what got us here? Well, the integration of multiple standardized resources, as listed here. This work has been generated not just by the SMPTE, or just by the uh, Video Services Forum, or just by AMWA in isolation. All of these entities and some more beyond that, such as SMPTE, such as AIMS, the IABM, the AES Society, IEEE, the IETF, all of these people listed all now contribute to this environment. And without them, we wouldn't have the success that we've had in such a short period of time. So what's the progression of the relative uh, standards part in IT? And this is probably this and a couple more slides is all I'm going to get into from the particular standards perspective. But you can see that the IEEE developed this 1588 version 1 first and then version 2 a few la years later as a universal proprietary, uh, not proprietary, universal application of um, timing and reference for systems across the globe. And it's not particularly uh, specific to broadcast but it is certainly specific to things like cellular timing, where you hand off from one cell point to another, satellite positioning and, and information, ships and, lab, uh, ships and so forth at, at sea for navigational purposes. All of the timing portions of it, particularly when you get involved in a network, are built around IEEE 1588. It, currently at V2, and there is a uh, work in process on either, maybe you call it a V2.1 or 2.x or V3, that's just going to bring on uh, technologies and concerns that have uh, developed over the last uh, five or six years. But what the uh, professional media networks needed to do was constrain some of these things. They needed to take the, all the broad spectrum of 1588 V2 and V3 is like a 500 plus page document coming out and, and pick them out, pick the specific things out related to uh, the broadcast application of the real time professional media networks, which became these two standards. The generation and alignment of interface signals from, uh, to the SMPTE epoch, which is that point in time on January 1st, 1970 at 000 GMT time or UTC time. And then the second part of it was the adoption of the 1588 PTP protocols and the professional broadcast applications. From SMPTE, from this to SMPTE and down to 2110, all of these became interlinked. Well, at the same time, work that began in the video services forum probably 15 years ago now uh, that came out with standards to develop the capabilities to take compressed video, that is 2022-1 through 4, over IP networks so they could transport in a similar and standardized fashion from one location or one venue to another, began to evolve to say, why don't we do this for uncompressed high bit rate video over IP, and that's what 
2022-5 through-8 is all about. So you take all of these capabilities and you develop what's now the SMPTE 2110 family of uh, standards, which are primarily for compressed video, at least to this point, compressed video and audio and ancillary data over IP networks, and now that's expanding into um, uh, un uh, compressed video as well. I'm sorry, this should have said uncompressed video, and it's also emerging into compressed video. So another way of looking at this, which brings in the IETF, the I Internet Engineering Task Force, was th these two core principles, 45, uh, 4566 and 4175 moved down into the thread and the work that the video services forum was doing to, to identify needs, to identify gaps in technology, to identify and, and a request for technology proposals from manufacturers and vendors and end users, um, to develop what eventually became the core internet capabilities as constrained and needed for the SMPTE standards, which included things like RP-168, that's the vertical interval standard, this is where you switch a particular, ver um, tech, a particular line of video so that it's synchronous, and all of these capabilities as listed here. So those are two different kinds of perspectives of where and what happened probably over the last five or six years to develop this standard. A little bit more about the video services folks, because um, they continue, like other organizations, to develop uh, newer technologies. The TR01 standard, which is the transport of J2K type broadcast as a broadcast profile over MPEG-2 transport streams, um, which has just recently been updated to TR01 2018, which includes the same uh, functionality, but additional enhancements and things that you have learned since that was first adopted in April of 2013. And then v, uh, VS, VSS uh, TR, which is Technical Recommendation 02, uh, that's using RTCP for in-band signaling and media flow statuses done in March 2015. The TR03 and the 04, which are the ones you heard most about, uh, is related to ST2110 and 2022 itself. So it's the utilizations of these and both happening about the same time frame as um, the, the previous two and their improvements. <clears throat> so just a little bit more about how these standards evolved and the timeline behind them. This is the initial um, release at the, uh, was announced at IBC in 2017, published shortly thereafter, but I think the complete set of documents was done by, by the end of the year. Although the publication and the announcement was in um, September 2017, for the most part, the technical work had been done. The draft standards were completed. Everyone's bobblehead dogs, dolls were shaking, or shaking in the same direction. This allowed manufacturers to start building equipment in anticipation of completion of the standard sometime later in 2017. So if we remember, a lot of people said, well, we're not going to build 2000, uh, 2110 devices until the standard is completed. In reality, the standard was completed, and the things that were shown at the NAB um, and then a further in IBC were working models, which didn't change hardly at all, except maybe from the data or the, uh, the control architectures. Um, so we had the video portion of it. We had the general system uh, timing and definitions, which ripples through all of the standards. And we had 2110-30, which is uh, PCM, digital audio, in an uncompressed environment. So it's about the time that those were completed, of course, there's the next generation of the standard itself and the family of standard was well underway, but it needed to have a lot of I's dotted, T's crossed, and some testing uh, to be done. So what came next was uh, Dash 21, which is the traffic and shaping delivery. And eventually, we did Dash 40 uh, shortly thereafter. So this happened around um, Q1 of 2018 from a timeline standpoint, and then very shortly thereafter, we did the Dash 30 one, which is the AES uh, transparent audio portion of the standard. And people say, well, what's transparent audio? Those that really understand the depths of AES and AES 3 and so forth know that there are little bits like UCV and then another couple that were used by certain people, certain manufacturers that are different in consistency and structure than what um, 
straight PCM 24-bit linear type of uh, application, 24-bit sampling type uh, applications. This allows all of those capabilities because there's a lot that got carried in AES as broadcasters um, develop things. One, for example, but not necessarily specific, this is Dolby E carried in an AES-3 environment and embedded along with the, uh, the video and so forth. Well, we needed methodologies to carry there where it was applicable. So 31 is one of the latest of the uh, standards that's been, been adopted and completed, at least at that time. But you wonder, you keep hearing about the status that this is continuing to evolve. Well, that's very true. This is work that was just in, it's actually in final review right now. This is, has to do with adding timing capabilities, PTP type based timing capabilities to the signal structures for redundancy, that's dash seven, and for individual essence streams operating in a dash session, seven or redundancy mode. Um, the overview, this is kind of the, it, it's actually OV2110-0, I don't think the zeros are, uh, it's actually there, but this is the introduction that kind of said what this was all about, that SMPTE headquarters wrote. And then there are some things that are we're going on right now, um, a 2110-22, which will be called constant bit rate compressed video. Uh, that's in FCD ballot right now within SMPTE standards work. This is the ability to, to carry uh, a compressed signal. In the first case, it happens to be VC2, or otherwise known as DIRAC, D-I-R-A-C, uh, promoted by the uh, BBC and run through as a project. Also up and coming will be some things that are missing in signaling right now that are typically carried as um, RS-422 type data. That's called Dash 41 and Dash 42, which is the formatting of it, but it's gonna be called fast metadata. Uh, at the point in time right now, we're working on conceptual um, uh, charting or direction and trying to figure out how complex we need to make this. And, and this will be very applicable to things like HDR and SDR. When you have to switch between an SDR stream to an HDR stream, you need some metadata that is timed and synchronous to the flows themselves. I mean, really down to the point that you might conceivably have metadata for every single frame in a video uh, stream itself. And then there's another uh, recommended practice being adopted right now. This is 2110-23, <clears throat> otherwise called multi-stream. Uh, this is work still in process. Comments are being taken in this. It, for the w most part, the work's really been done. We're, we just want to make sure it's bulletproof, so to speak, before it gets out there. That's the ability to take and split a stream, such as a, um, a 4K signal, in a 10G switch across more than one port. So you take a portion of the, maybe equal portions of the flow and put it across 10, two 10G ports instead of having to compress it slightly and you move, put it through one 10G port. So that's work that's continuing on. Um, in addition to the uh, one year reviews and, and in SMPTE speak, any standard that's been developed and, and uh, uh, publicized by mandate of the, uh, uh, the rules in, within SMPTE we go through a review of this. So it's like, what have we learned? What needs to be changed, if anything? What needs to be added to a particular standard? So Dash 10 is being uh, done right now. It is headed for uh, what they call pre-FCD review, and then it will go to a ballot to be uh, looked upon by the, uh, by the uh, committee members and so forth. Um, having to do the timing and reference sig signalings throughout the system. And then uh, ST 2059-1 and Dash 2, are currently in there in the same stage, a pre-FCD uh, review. This is, uh, what, what's holding some of this back is any of the changes that are anticipated from the IEEE 1588 V, whatever the next standard number happens to be. And then there's another project having, uh, uh, from a Dash 20 perspective, it's called a project proposal for one year review. This is the video portion of the 2110 standard that will be looked at and decided is it worth updating? Do we need to make changes to it? Uh, and what will be those change? What are those potential uh, changes? So internally, there's a comment period going on where everyone's being asked to look at this and get feedback from end users, from their own engineers. Do we need to make changes or adjustments to Dash 20? Outside of the SMPTE side of the world, we also had these two organizations, AMWA and the VSF, that are working on, on these changes as well. 
including uh, a project promoted primarily in, in part from the, ampli from the uh, presentation standpoint by Wes Simpson. It's called a canonical naming system for 2110-20 video formats. This will be groundbreaking technology. As we all know, there's a plethora of different types of video standards out there before you even get to IP. Take, for example, um, 1920-1080. There's interla interlace and progressive. There's 5994. There's 60. There's 50. There's 30. Every one of those, depending upon where you look, are ordered differently, are stated differently, or may not be included in a particular specification, even though it says it's compliant with that particular standard. So the canonical naming system will be a, a catalog, if you will, of specific ways that these are spelled out, what's comprised on them, and what they will do for the, uh, for the enterprise, so that the SDPs, or the Session Description Protocol, information that is imperative to the receivers and transmitters of IP 2110 standards is spelled out the right way and you don't get manufacturer X doing meaning to say something one way only to have it misinterpreted by manufacturer Z. And we found out this is needed as a result of many of uh, the interop sessions and the, uh, the pre-staging for the trade shows which included IP showcase. Other things that are happening is uh, TR05 2018, that's a video format description requirements. They start to hone in on very precise uses and applications for the various standards. There's work underway on a, a uh, 2110 over WAN and its best practices for long haul transport. And there's a 2110 format emulation uh, project. You can also see Wes Simpson, sorry to put you on the spot, Wes, wherever you are, but he's the guy that, that knows the most about that. So that's what's happening in VSF that's applicable to the, the 2110 type of environments. In addition to this, I talked earlier about automation and the, the detection of the signals, the detection of the devices on the network, how they get into a server and a database and a registry and so forth. Well, that's work that's been done by AMWA. And at this point, besides ISO 4, 5, and 6, which are pretty stable right now and been shown, if not implemented by uh, a number of different manufacturers, um, ISO 7 is in a phase called their phase two starting. And what happened was ISO 7, which is an event and tally type of uh, metadata or systemization, was shown at the NAB and it got a lot of feedback from people. A lot of things were, may have been missing or overlooked or need to be looked at. So ISO 7 has one particular version, but we're looking at, at what the second phase will that be? What more do we need to do to make tally effective? How does it get used and so forth? And ISO 9, which is a system resources, there are other things called uh, the BCP's best current practices, 03-01 on security, another one on authorization of systems. This is to prevent hacking. I mean, if you want to take a, P, a, a 21 system down in a real hurry, hack the PTP and turn it off. Everything will collapse and there'll be a nightmare to get it all back up again. So that's very important. In addition, SEMPI is also doing a study group on the same thing of 2059 security and protection. Um, network me uh, media incubator meetings and virtual workshops are still going on. And this is all open. I mean, you, you, can, you can look at what's going on. Most of the developments on GitHub. So if you go to the AMWA, you Google any of these, you'll find links to see what's actually happening by the various developers and so forth. Um, ISO 8 version 1.0 is audio channelization, which is also shown and released at NAB. And then another one called IS um, 10, which is an authorization server API. So you can see that this is not stopping. This is continuing to move on. And in many cases, we're getting some of the first beta code from some of these manufacturers and putting it into this system so we can learn what it does and what, what's shortfalls and what's, uh, what's working and what's not. So, um, a little bit of an introduction to what we've been doing with the IP uh, Roadshow. Again, I said this was developed as a training program internally for our company. We are now presenting it to SEMPTI meetings. I think we've done three or four SEMPTI meetings. We've taken it to Microsoft Production Studios, um, to our Kenilworth and CNN customers, NEP in Pittsburgh, uh, WPXI at Cox. These are some of the locations from our office structure. So we've 
probably trained about 250 plus engineers within our own company. And then we carry, they're usually a two-day program, and then we do a third day, which is, involves private client meetings, either our clients or others that are interested uh, to come in. And maybe they just want to talk and not expose to others uh, what their concerns are and how you approach these designs. So we carry these sessions on as well. And, and I'd be remiss in not thanking and letting you know the partners that have made this happy, happen. Rather, Every one of these uh, manufacturers, Tektronix, Arista, Video Clarity, and so forth, have contributed hardware to this, and not just hardware, software visions, um, painstaking hours sometimes with, us, with this system to get the integration and so forth to, to perform and work properly. In addition, when we do the training, we pull select manufacturer subject matter experts out, and they come in and do an hour or an hour and a half presentation on a technology applicable not just to their products, but the system overall. So again, this is a system that, that works in the 2110 environment. There's not a single piece of gear there that is not 100% ST2110 compliant. Now, we, we could do 2022-7. There are capabilities in there, but we felt it more important to to t address the 2110 system. And that's what we're, we're bringing here for you to see, touch, and, and look at. So at this point, I'm going to, um, you want me to do this? OK. <laughs> this was supposed to be Phil's place. Um, this is the road show itself, just um, kind of kind of the, the components we have here. Um, at the top is the Tektronix Prism. You can kind of see the, the, uh, the, the system components here. The venue player is a four channel. IP in, IP out um, video player running on 10G. We are running primarily 1080p 60 type signals out of it. Uh, we have two sync generators, an IP, uh, PTP source one, and a source two. We have failover capabilities. We can demonstrate what happens when you pull the plug out, how it fails over, and then you can see on the screen up there and the, uh, uh, atop the kit there what happens, how it finds the new PTP generator how it uses the best master clock algorithms to determine that so that we can teach engineers and users what to look for when things change over. We have an Imagine control panel here and a, con and a Grass Valley control panel. Um, both of them are running on 100 megabit systems. It's probably the lowest data rate we've gotten in the system. But that's because the panels have been long time using um, data rates, which are certainly sufficient, but they go to a, uh, an, an outboard Netgear type switch in the back and then come out as a one gig signal out of that to get it into the switches. And you went, why do we go through all of that? Well, none of these switches over here in this system are low grade, uh, mediocre type switches. They're all enterprise class, full build, bandwidth, full tilt, 10 gigabit or greater, and it's very, rare now to find a switch that does a one gigabit uh, dedicated type port. So we have to put things into this, such as uh, SFPs with RJ45s on them that take a one gig signal in as a port system into that, or we have to find um, a one gig fiber SFP that goes into it. But this is where, as time goes on, manufacturers will start to develop SFP-based type control panels that can handle, uh, get the data rates up there so that we don't have to go through the headaches of having uh, discrete, not as good a quality, I guess is a polite way of saying it, switching capabilities um, in the system. So what is also unique about this is that we have both Arista switches and Cisco switches in here. And people say, why in the world do we do that? Well, because we wanted to demonstrate that if you follow the rules, you can do this. You can mix switch environments. You can mix, mix orchestration environments. You can mix control panels and send them across one switch, come out of another switch into an orchestrator, into a, uh, the other manufacturer switch, and get it on the system. And, and really wanted to see if this was truly achievable, a and it is. So uh, we also have some processing here, the uh, Imagine Selenium network processor here. And we have some test equipment that you might not normally find in many facilities. Uh, but it was essential, and we, we have exercised this product in many times to demonstrate 
what happens with packet interval timing discrepancies, what happens if you drop a particular stream of packets, what, what does the video look like if you purposely change the packet structure in some way or change the numbers in it, and then the, the devices can monitor what's happening. That's primarily the VIP. This is a capture replay server, so it, rather than, um, uh, and uh, in fairness, there's capture replay capabilities in the prism. This is a more exotic and longer term type of system that can also be triggered on failure or particular numbers that the VIP might determine. So suppose, for example, that you had a, a certain time of day or you had a certain setup in your operation that created a glitch. We don't have to get specific what the glitch is, but it could be a glitch. And there's probably no way you're gonna find that in real time. So if you recognize that was a problem, you could trigger on certain devices or certain instances on a particular port or a particular switch itself, capture those streams on here, and then go back in non-real time and look at that until you identify where the problem might be. It might be a failing SFP. It might be somebody wiggling on a cable because that's when they you know, clean the room or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so those are test instruments that um, we certainly recommend new installations and greenfield installations deal with as well as some other products from, from PacketStorm. Uh, and then we have a VMware and hypervisor system down here which runs all the, the virtual sides of the system. So that's the left side. Um, this is the right side. It's a spine and leaf um, system. So we have a spine called spine one from Arista, that's the model number, and we have a spine two from, um, from Cisco. And the Cisco system has two leafs that we're, we're using on it, and the Arista system has one leaf. So, and there'll be a diagram of what this looks like in a few minutes. Other products in here, this is the t uh, TSL products PAM, uh, PAM2 IP. It's a, uh, both an audio and an, S and an SDI type equivalent monitor, plus it will look at um, dash 20, dash 30, and dash 40 capabilities. So this might be something you'd find sitting in front of a technical production manager or in, in some portion of your rack room where you wouldn't necessarily have the more sophisticated gear. Um, we have a couple of products, the two of the IQ UCP 2550, when the 25 is 25 gig, the 50 is 50 gig. Uh, two cards inside uh, this, it, you notice it has a SAM uh, symbol on it. That's just happened to be coincidence that we got this at the same time that uh, uh, Sam and so forth were going. Five minutes? Wow. <laughs> time goes fast. Anyway, these are the convergence of the orchestration system, one from Grass Valley and one from Imagine. And then uh, our, two, our two channel players out here and the multi-viewer uh, from Grass Valley. So this is what the system looks like from um, a signal perspective. So these are all the boxes and all the types of signals and their data rates that are going through here. Um, this is a little bit about how we architect or figure out the, uh, um, what I want to say, the, the addressing and mapping for the systems here. These are the kind of diagrams we use. Um, this is how the Tektronix Prism and the PAM2 are connected. You can see the unicast addresses, you can see the management addresses, and we keep the uh, multicast addresses off of this diagram just to, because those are uh, uh, just adding more uh, confusion and clutter. So in this particular diagram, we've, highed, uh, we've highlighted where PTP is, the one gig systems here. Uh, here's how PTP is carried in this case. And here's how the video, si uh, video clarity uh, system, the players carry it. Again, PTP, when it says on the media port, that's carried in the same stream as the media itself. Sometimes they're isolated, but if you follow the rules, it needs to be a multicast environment that carries the timing in the same structure as the media itself. This is the, PT the PTP for the rest of it. PTP on media here again. In fact, PTP is carried on the media uh, translate, uh, transport through all of those systems there. So this is just a, a, a quick detail about the differences in the switch. The Arista in this case is a 600 gigabit uplink. All ports are configurable at these data rates. Uh, to set the bandwidth in the port, you replug the particular SFPs and change the bandwidth. So it's a very universal type of application. 
in the Cisco Nexus, Nexus series. It's a 400 gigabit uplink, but there are constraints to how this 400 gigabits is allocated, and it uses Cisco licenses, S, licensed SFPs in most cases. So uh, Arista uses one uh, spine and one leaf, and the Cisco Nexus system uses one spine and two leaves. This is how that particular spine leaf configuration works. You can see they're all cross-connected. The Cisco talks to the leaf here. The Arista talks to both the Cisco leaves. Leaf. So this is, allows us to keep the signal management throughout the whole system. By the way, this might be how you would build, say, a red network and a blue network. Same kind of concept here, but we're not doing redundant networks. We're carrying a common uh, architecture across the two pairs of switches. This is how the unicast and uh, um, addressing happens to work. Again, these are quite in depth, but you can, if you study these, you'll see how we developed a common architecture for our addressing and management, which is really the first stage of designing a system. Here's the Cisco spine to Arista and where those get connected across. Very similar numbering systems. You can see the slashes here to say that that is you know, one port address, not, or one stream, not in other cases where you'd have, say, a slash 24, which would give you more key, a more stream capability. Um, this is the Arista spine to link and VLAN um, connections, as well as the uplinks. Very, very similar architectures. This is the spine to leaf uh, from the Cisco perspective. And since we have both a leaf one and a leaf two, you can see how we carry this across. The kinds of signals, there's four sets of 100 gig QSFP uh, MTP signals here, the same here in both of these cases. You can notice the port addressing we tried to keep the same. There's commonality and consistency across these systems so that it, you don't have to go look up on a chart every time you're uh, wondering what's going on in the system. Uh, this is the IP addressing roadmap and it gets a little more of an eye chart itself. Uh, but you can see we have the unicast addresses, the multicast port addresses, what type of signal flow and where it's applicable. You can see the management layers. So those are all the key components that go into building a, a design a system like that. And um, some of the, the main flows and so forth that are going on here, that, for example, these are what we're trying to do here, and I'm gonna show a little quick demonstration about how um, these systems are put together and what the flows are from a standpoint of what happens when you push that button. So control of the prism is via an API and the Imagine SDNO. Uh, the TSL products come off the 10G side using Ember Plus from Cisco Leaf, off from the Cisco Leaf, and these are the signals that will carry. The router control panels, as I explained earlier, 100 megabit type Ethernet to Netgear switches. The Grass Valley Multiviewer is a KIPP um, 320X. It's, a, a pair, uh, it's from a pair of 100 gig connections, one from the Cisco and one from the Arista. So that's how we get all the signals into that system and then it's routable uh, yeah, through the control panels over here. And then we also have uh, over, it's not in the rack because we just got that like yesterday, is uh, an EEG HD 492. This is uh, running on 10 gig on port 23 of the Larista Leaf. It decodes dash 30 audio, does a speech to text conversion, then changes the metadata to do dash 40, 2110 dash 40 caption data, which is decoding closed caption and it appears then um, on the Grass Valley KIPP multiplayer. Now we were in process of configuring that today. We literally ran out of time with other schedule, so we don't have that demonstrated. We could show the black box, but there's no text into it. But, so this is one example of where we are crossing um, dimensions from a dash 30 to a dash 40 metadata type application. Um, this is what I spoke about when you push the button sort of thing. So we have Imagine uh, router control panel and Grass Valley's router control panel into this switch, a, a one gig management Ethernet connection into the Arista leaf. And if you remember, everything's cross-connected. So this data can get recalled by any of the devices that are necessary. So in the case of the Tektronix Prism, what's happening is it's being told to join or to leave one multicast and join another as a result of a control panel push button that talked to the uh, Imagine Magellan SDNO and the orchestration layers themselves. 
and then in the case of the Cisco portion of it, we can get those same signals routed by all the cross connections we had to the PAM, uh, TSL PAM system there. Uh, these are just the other ancillary portions of, of where things get through in the system and what ports they are. So you could find these port numbers on that gigantic spreadsheet there. You could find the actual IP addressing numbers and you could find out what the signal flow is. But that's a lot of work. So that's what this automation process is all about is so that you can go to one central panel and figure out how and what to do with a system. So again, we're, since we're running a little bit out of time, this is um, what's happening in the routing control system. You're managing a grouping of elements in a router control system. You're managing names for those groups for the elementary signal sources themselves, and you're managing the names for the groups of the elementary receivers. So you now, you now have to deal with both the receivers and the senders in this environment in order to get it to work. Um, routing, the routing itself, that's the network routing itself, is connected from the source group to a destination group and it will confirm with a positive status or not. And, and sort of like what's under the hood is what's on the right-hand side. So an operator action is command says, please take camera seven to monitor three. Well, what's happening in this lower part down here is monitor three is already getting um, camera seven, is going to get camera seven, and this would be the operator status itself. Um, the, what happens is the routing control system says, hey, monitor three, switch your video to group, in this particular case, 238.6.7.22, port 20,000, with its dimensions of 1920 by 1080. So now you've given instructions to the system, which we do, which happens all the time over here, not only the signal routing from a multicast address standpoint, but also the dimensions of the signal itself. And what happens on the screen when that transition is completed is that you've now moved this multicast address as shown here, and now monitor three is getting camera, camera seven as is expected from a human perspective. And then these are the things that actually happen for the uh, control environment itself. IGMP leaves and joins in each of the cases there. There's a lot, lot to this, so I'm gonna skip through it very quickly because um, we've got another speaker coming up here. But this is kind of what happens is in the SDNO, uh, it maintains a cached copy of all the stream details, and that's re the reason for that, or one of the reasons for that, is this is the approach that Imagine has taken to feeding IP streams to their multi-viewer. Grass Valley's approach is different, TAGS is different, so every one of these systems have different approaches and different value propositions for them, depending upon size and scale. Um, the user at the panel makes a name-based request in some routing protocol, um, hey, source, whatever that source happens to be, camera three, send it to the Tektronix prism. The third thing that happens is the SDNO turns the names into individual streams and receivers. This is sort of happening in parallel in the background and all of it in real time. So the SDNO then communicates with the new stream details to each involved receiver using the per uh, particular protocol that's for that device itself. Um, each receiver then issues an IGMP join for the new stream and leaves its old stream behind. It basically just drops that flow. And then the last thing is the status of the stream switch command is translated back to the names based status in the many protocols. And this is where you get the naming uh, conventions with the name change on the panel itself or the information that goes to the tally system for the UMDs itself. So uh, this is fundamentally what's happening, and look at all the protocols that are now having to be addressed. The Ember uh, Plus protocol, for example, the different drivers for the ISO 4 and ISO 5, all of these components are now happening on a network, whereas in the past we've dealt with it as discrete signaling, uh, RS-422 type signaling, maybe a network which is an Ethernet type signaling and so forth. And we're showing this to give you an idea of the complexity of what's going on under the hood and what the future broadcast engineer, broadcast technologist uh, will need to be doing. So that's okay. what I've got. Very good, Carl. Thank you so much. Um, so, so just for everybody's uh, information, these, um, uh, this presentation was being live streamed uh, to YouTube. There will be a uh, recording of it available um, on the um, Simpton New York 
uh, via uh, YouTube channel, so um, we can give you the address for that. Um, also, uh, we'll we'll f have a chance for Carl to ask answer some um, some detailed questions um, about uh, the the system architecture and let you um, take a look at it uh, after our uh, second speaker uh, is done for the uh, for the evening, and um, we'll uh, we'll take it from there. So thanks everybody. Um, now we'll switch over. So. Uh, our next speaker is John Bertoni. He's the global account manager for AT&T. Um, he works for EMC Dell Technologies. Uh, John is a global account manager supporting AT&T services for his strategic customers across all industry verticals. Throughout the evaluation of evolution of cloud, he has aligned Dell technical solutions to enable AT&T to meet market and customer demand. In 2012, John began helping AT&T build and grow cloud storage businesses to complement AT&T's application hosting and managed services offerings. With the merger of Dell and EMC, John is helping AT&T's customers optimize their applications and processes across the hybrid cloud landscape. So we'll switch over to him and um, let him uh, give you a, a good um, overview of what we're doing. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is that we have, um, at uh, right around 8 o'clock tonight, we will be, uh, there. We, you may experience some interruption of uh, network connectivity here, Wi-Fi, things like that. We're not taking down the cell phone network. But um, there is uh, an ongoing um, system upgrade going on here in this building, so we will um, definitely, you know, uh, try to get everything done by 8 o'clock, and then we'll be able to come over here. We won't turn the lights off, though. We're not going to make it black for, uh, you know, 120 people that are here in this building. So <laughs> take it away, John. All right. Turn this one. Does that work? Yes. Excellent. And no feedback. So it must be a decent shield. I never thought I'd be termed a shield to things, but hey, it works. Okay. Um, full disclosure, I am not going to get as technical as that last speaker was. I'm not even close. All right, so if we delve into the, the technical, we're not building clouds tonight. We're not going to configure any VMs. None of that's going to happen. All right, we're just going to talk about the general industry, where, where customers are using cloud, what I as a um, account manager, but also in a previous life, I was in the outsourcing world and a Gartner consultant, see in this, this cloud world we are. And I'm going to try and draw some parallels to the old outsourcing world because I see a lot of the same behaviors happening. I see a lot of the same results. And as an old consultant, I see a lot of opportunities coming from it because people aren't doing things right. So with that, we'll launch into um, you know, some of the uh, uh, you know, statistics that we've, that we've seen out there. Um, you know, as far as adoption goes, we're seeing, uh, based on some, some uh, research by Deloitte, uh, we're seeing about 55% of uh, the households you know, have, they're, they're using streaming services. Uh, you know, it's, it's spread across uh, a number of different age groups. Uh, it's not just Gen X. It's not just, uh, you know, millennials. It's, it goes across all of them, and the, the, the uptake is, is quite large. Um, that comes up to about $2 billion monthly. Um, and what's, what's very interesting here is that uh, of that 200, uh, 2 billion a month, there are about 200 or so um, offers out there for video on demand. Okay? And it's growing. All right? Even AT&T is, you know, getting more into the game of that. Um, and your average user across that has three 
that they do at any given, um, you know, three subscriptions that they have at any given time. You know, I didn't think I would have five. Okay, I'm a cord cutter, so I got rid of pay TV. I'm now a cord cutter. Um, but you know, an old guy like me now has that. Um, you know, but while we have an increased amount of um, subscribers using video on demand and these streaming services, that's hurting pay TV. Pay TV is also, you know, you probably you're seeing it take a hit. Uh, a lot of customers are dissatisfied. Um, you know, 75% of people say there are too many commercials. 82% are frustrated with the level of service they're getting today from pay TV. And now there are a lot of options out there. All right? And this, this one was really interesting here. 36% of households have some kind of digital assistant in it. And that's driving, I'll stand back over here. That's driving greater video consumption. A lot of it now is just music, but it's gonna start to drive video as well, okay? Maybe not coming off of a TV, but coming off of a YouTube, okay? Coming off of a different device that's streaming out there. Should I move this? Up, good, okay, cool. So what do we talk about tonight? We'll talk about the new game that's out there, what it's like, the elements of that new game. Let's keep the double chin out of the way. What's driving that cloud adoption? Um, you know, there's a lot of terms out there. Some are used, some are misused. Uh, we'll try to come to a common vernacular about what is cloud, what is hybrid cloud that you see up there, and where we as Dell Technologies see the multi-cloud world coming into play. Um, you know, I take care, like I said uh, in, my, like was in, in my introduction, I go across a lot of different industries for AT&T. Um, we have our media and entertainment practice but we also look at how healthcare companies or industrial manufacturers are taking on. And it's amazing to see that there's a lot of parallels going on here. So it's very easy to draw these, these you know, same conclusions. They'll happen in the media and, you know, media and entertainment industry um, just with a slightly different flavor, all right? And then, you know, at the end of the day, I'll, bring, I'll take my consulting hat out and, and look for those parallels from the old time, the outsourcing world ago. Look for those cloud cautions. How do you actually go there? So you're gonna, have, you're gonna be going to the cloud or you may have already been going to cloud. Any, anybody already started to go to the cloud or already there? One guy, two, three, all right, a few, all right? There'll be some greater adoption. Where is it better to use a public? Okay, where is it better to use more of a hybrid approach? And we'll get into what, the, what those things actually mean. All right, this is the new game, All right? There's really four elements of that. And if, you, and if you look at any of the common services, the disruptors out there, you'll see that they have these four common elements to them, all right? Um, tremendous data growth. All right, and that revolves around the need to monetize the content. And when you, you know, you just can't have a video clip out there anymore, you gotta have all the metadata attached to it. That's driving tremendous amounts of data storage, databases, data lakes, what we call them. All right, um, it's, it's unbridled, so you need a place to put that. Then you need to be able to have that data available to the user. Okay, whether that's in a work stream setting or, or as part of their workflow or um, the end user, okay? They want it to be, you know, they want to know that that content is there. You know, look at, you know, look at a Netflix of the world, right? What's yours? What do we recommend for you? It's all based on what you've done with the data, what you've done with that content before. 
Um, I was at Sports Video Group earlier this year, just before NAB. We had a very good discussion around um, how they're starting to use cloud a little bit more, how they're starting to use AI a little bit more. Uh, some of those requirements being, you know, that analytics and that data needs to flow from clip to clip to clip, you know, clip to clip to clip as they start to do it. Um, and that's one of the challenges because those, that metadata isn't flowing to the thing. Um, user's ex expectation, okay, I want it to be simple. I don't want a learning curve. I don't want to, you know, I just got to be able to use it. All right, and the last part is extremely important, all right, because within this new cloud environment, data flows back and forth seamlessly. And that requires that um, there be a level of security and common security posturing across all the clouds that you go, all right? Otherwise, those assets are put at risk, customer data is put at risk, um, your own, you know, assets are put at risk, all right? Everybody calls, uh, you know, the public cloud a, uh, a revolution. Uh, we think of it more as an enabler. Right? It's a tool. Right? It's there. It enables a lot of things. But the public cloud um, wouldn't have, you know, since it's there, it really enables that new game. It enables you to put data in places. It allows the flexibility. It allows you to try new business models without invest, you know, without substantial investment. It allows you to flex in, in, in uh, busy times, okay? Game of Thrones, okay? Final episode, right? That was all cloud-based, right? ML BAM, they expanded their capacity out there to handle the influx of viewers that needed to do it. And all of the different, um, you know, formats that it needed to go. And, and, you know, there needed to be a common user experience across everybody that watched it that night. And on top of that, it couldn't go down. Okay, it couldn't go down like every other premiere episode for the past seven seasons, all right? It needed to stay up this time, all right? Um, You know, it, it, public cloud also does a lot of good things for um, the incumbents, okay? It gives them a, uh, a venue, a place to go in which to compete against those folks who built cloud native, okay? Netflix, keep the double chin out of the way. Netflix built their model in the cloud from 2012. All right? It gave them amazing abilities to scale, to grow their business, to try new things, to take advantage and define the game. But it came at a price. And this is one of the cautions to take away. Anybody remember when Amazon got into the world of video? Yeah. Who's got it? I got it. Okay. One of Amazon's biggest customers is Netflix. And now, Amazon just got into Netflix's business. Netflix went upon and started to do an examination and said, how do we get away from Amazon? How do we start to bring that all back into our own data centers or go someplace else? They quickly found out that their scale had grown so big that they couldn't. 
so they're stuck there. All of their applications are built for Amazon. Amazon right now does not talk to Google, does not talk to Microsoft, okay? Doesn't talk to VMware, well, it talks a little bit to VMware, but doesn't, you know, doesn't, it's not native, all right? So for them to bring all those applications back would be tremendously um, bad for the customer, for, for Netflix and their customer experience. They couldn't do this without you know, disrupting their customers. So that's one of the cautions, is to not get so big in there that if you really, when you go into it and say, we might need to take this back, that you can't. This is something that uh, we did with AT&T um, up in the cloud, all right? Actually, we did this in a cloud, and it's intended to go on the edge, all right? Those, that edge being at the hockey game, all right? So we're going to put a cloud in a truck. And that cloud is going to be running an application from a partner of ours called IdentTV. All right, and what we're looking to do is deliver, one of the things that we're looking to do is uh, to deliver not only for the team, but for the league, who's getting unearned media, all right? So we're going to analyze video. We found that the, it was valuable to run that at the venue, okay? And we're going to count how many times Ticketmaster is on the screen. Ticketmaster not being somebody who advertises the game, they're a sponsor, they put their name on the board, great. All right? So what we do is we do, you know, we look at that, we do all the counts on the screen, and then we say, all right, how much is that worth? And in this example, we said it was $5 a second. So, you know, Ticketmaster only costs us, uh, for this small clip, $10.50 in lost revenue. So now it's good for the league or for the team to go to Ticketmaster and say, you know, this is how much extra value going with the Flyers is, or the Rangers, okay, is. So you should sign up a little, do a little bit more with us, maybe sign up a little bit of time on MSG, okay, to do that. All right. What else? Is, who else is using the cloud? Okay, a couple of quick examples. Uh, Endemol Shine. Um, any? They uh, they do Big Brother. All right. What they're doing is uh, they're indexing files. Okay, Vindi indexing the clips. They're actually getting suggestions from the feeds on what to actually include in the shows. You know, and this is across, mm, there's like eight or 900 different shows that they put together um, across 275 channels, 250 million users, okay? It frees their people up to look for something new, okay? Uh, NBC Sports, anybody from NBC Sports here? Whew. Hopefully I was going to get this right. Um, the Olympics in Rio, um, they did a lot, okay? 4,500 4, hours of content was made available. They did this with Microsoft. Um, 3.3 billion minutes of streaming during the Olympics. Uh, 100 million unique viewers and um, 100 live HD streams going on any that were available at any point in time. It was interesting that Avid is now going with Microsoft uh, to build their business, 
okay? Um, for the Avid Media Central platform, okay? So they're gonna work with Amazon, I mean, my, with Microsoft to build that. Um, La Liga was interesting in that they were, wanted to, they, they built their own innovation platform up in the cloud uh, to launch websites, applications that engage fans more, right? That was really important for them than just showing games. So they're trying to help people learn about players, uh, appreciate the, the game of football in Spain a little bit better. Um, and then NBC Universal went in a completely different direction, um, not with one particular cloud, but they looked and said, uh, only about 20% of their budgets were being uh, used for application development. That other 80% is just keeping legacy applications alive and running. So they went and said, we've got to do, we've got to flip that. So they, uh, they're, they're working with Pivotal right now to create a uh, agnostic app, cloud agnostic app development platform. So that basically says, if I want to put it over in Google, I can put it over in Google quickly, all right? If I want to go to Amazon, great, I can do it. If I want to keep it on my own, I can do that too. It depends on where I want to move it, and I've got a way of taking that application and moving it, or moving instances of it quickly where I need it to go. Gives them greater agility out there. So, have we reached a tipping point? Uh, I can't say we have or we haven't, but as we start to hear conversations, it's, the, the conversation always involves cloud. It's no longer, I need to virtualize an environment. I now need to think about, you know, going to cloud. I don't need to take my cloud, you know, some of my native already virtualized environments and moving them to a uh, modernized infrastructure, right? It's now I need to use a cloud, all right? What's, how, what, why? We talked about that for um, NBC Universal, free FIT time, all right? Costs, all right, uh, scale it up and down and better, so that flex time. Um, are, are good ways to do it. Um, and freeing up IT time also requires, you know, as we start to talk about things, the, under, the underpinning element here is that you're always thinking about the app. In a digital, the digital world, it starts with the app. What do you want the app to do and how important is the app, okay? That's your underpinning. So driving that cloud migration is probably taking a lot of legacy applications, putting them into a place where we don't have to worry about modernizing infrastructure. We have an SLA pegged to, you know, uptime and IOPS and things like that. Um, and I can then go and not worry about it. Okay, or maybe look at it once a week. All right, so if you want to go to the cloud, all right, first one should be pretty, pretty self-explanatory, all right. If you've got something that was never meant for the cloud and you've got to move it to the cloud, it's going to be a lot harder than moving something, putting something in cloud that was already meant for it, all right. Um, we'll talk about multi-cloud. Okay, and why performance dictates that. Um, but we talked about it just a little bit uh, just now. Um, application infrastructures, I'm sure we've all gone through this. Um, you know, the specialized infrastructure, it's, it's getting expensive. Maintaining it, all right. Every, you know, I've seen budgets under, under scrutiny. We're gonna do that. And here's the most important one. Migration skills are rare. You don't want to do it, and you usually don't keep guys around that are really good at doing migrations. 
Once you do it, it's migrated. I don't need that guy anymore. All right? It's typically not a core competency of most operate shops or build shops. All right, so, um, you know, this just says it a little bit in a little bit different way. Um, but this is what, what uh, we see CIOs grappling with every day. Uh, you know, how do I balance my existing and my uh, cloud native workloads? All right, what do I do with them? All right, um, the expectation for most organizations now is that, you know, I've got a public cloud and I've got a private cloud. All right, it's already multiple clouds. All right, and we see, you know, the IDC said 93%. Okay, we'll do that. The reality, though, is that for any, you know, if you do, if you look at your applications, where you need them, uh, what you need them to do, it's going to be a combination. Okay, and you might even have multiple private clouds over here. All right, and then have public clouds. All right, and and we'll talk about how we use them. But basically, um, you know, at the end of the day, once you start to use multiple clouds, uh, we're gonna you got a whole bunch of stuff going on here. If you just use your cloud for um, you know, one task, you're going to start to create silos, operational silos, even within Amazon itself. So if you use it, it's like, okay, I got, each one has its dashboard, Google's doesn't work with Microsoft's. So you have um, all these different tools. <sighs> Security, we've already started to talk about that. All right. Um, and every time there's uncertainty and all these things start to add up, your adoption goes down. Your ability to operate effectively in the cloud also goes down. So we need to operate uh, a little bit better, okay? So let's, let's start to, and I, I wanna pull up the right right thing, because we're gonna talk about two things here. Um, this is where we start to talk about hybrid clouds and native public clouds. Um, you know, they're two, two distinct things, and, I'll, and I apologize for reading, but I wanna get it right. Um, hybrid cloud, all right? It's a multi-cloud model in which operations between two or more clouds are common and where orchestration between the two environments is handled by a singular tool. All right? So it's commonly achieved from a private cloud or an edge to a public cloud. Um, and we're also including in this the ability to move between two public clouds. All right, so the key here is that you've got a single set of tools that manage orchestration's the same, your virtualization is the same. So your clouds talk to one another, okay? Whether it's on-prem, up in the public, or out on the edge. Native public is simply that. It's Amazon, it's Azure, it's Google, it's the hyperscalers. Uh, it's some smaller companies that are out there that may be more niche uh, operated. But um, each cloud operates independently. Okay, own set of tools, and they can be great for certain things. Smile, it's a good picture. <laughs> I only got one of them, so I'm, I'm good. I haven't put the whole audience to sleep. I feel better. All right, so we've got consistent infrastructure, consistent infrastructure, consistent operations. This is great. This, so this model is, I, I really need to keep my, my assets close and private, but I'm gonna see them, I might have busy times, I need to flex, or I might take things 
Five minutes? Okay, we'll do this. All right. And everybody agrees, okay? So this is the, when we talk about moving apps to the cloud and this is the, these are the eye charts, but this is our approach, all right? It's not just a, let's pick that app, these are all these things. All right, first we'll go through a discovery, find out what's out there, all right? Which of those applications are uh, necessary and important, uh, strategic to the company, which are not, which are legacy, which can we set and forget, okay? Which are mission critical, which are not mission critical, okay? Um, again, starts with the app. Let's define what, we, what we're trying to do here with the app, all right? Then we'll rationalize them, okay? So we'll, you know, now we'll start to look at the workflow. How do each of these apps interact with your workflow? All right, if our intent is to move them all out, then into a cloud, then let's try and figure that out. Okay, how do they interact with your workflow? All right, what's our investment strategy? All right, so do we modernize it? Do we migrate it out? Okay. Do we kill it? Is it just not necessary? Sorry for getting in the way. Um, is it just not necessary? All right. Then we'll look at what's the right cloud? Is Amazon better than Google? Is private better than going to Azure? And we'll look at it in a number of different dimensions. And that's, this is what you should be looking at. All right. Then within the workflow. Where are the dependencies? How do the applications talk to one another? And then we'll start to profile things. Where to do things, okay? We'll figure out what's best to move. Where are we gonna get the biggest bang for the buck? Essentially is what I call this part of the exercise. It's an economic analysis, it's an operational analysis. All right? So those are the simple steps. And these are the simple questions. Not all of them, but some of them. All right? What do you want your cloud to do? Do you want to build a whole workflow up in the cloud, in a cloud? Or do you just want to do one job? Do you just want to do metadata tagging? All right? It's an outsourcing versus an outtasking world. Okay? What do you really want to do? You know, again, we just talked about are your apps ready? Um, where are the interfaces? And this goes back to my old outsourcing world, all right? When I had um, customers who were doing app development, business process outsourcing, uh, and I'd go into them and talk about their, their new process that they just outsourced. Okay, and I said, how's it going? He goes, on my best day, it takes two days longer than I had when I did it before. And I said, why? Hey, why did you do it? Which was a great consultant thing. I got to say, why'd you do it? But two is we, we started to discover that it was these interfaces where one party was sending something down to the other, they didn't know actually to expect when to expect it. There was no communication. I work with AT&T, the biggest communication company in the world. You know, it's, it's that communication, all right? That's what we look to expose. That's what we look to remedy, all right? And if your workflow, if your workflow today needs to talk to one another, if you put it up into the cloud, it also needs to talk to one another, all right? It's two minutes, and this is my last slide, so we're good. All right, security posture, we've talked about that. How are your users going to work with this? Really important. Do they have the connectivity? What are their SLAs? What are their, do they have, you know, the workstations now that can handle that to do their job? 
right? Go fully public. That's a you know risk reward kind of thing. If you've got some, if you want to keep some some existing stuff, you got to look at your existing uh, infrastructure. Uh, we've talked. Do you have the appropriate connectivity and network? Like I said, this ain't just pipes. All right. It's if you don't want somebody to know that you're actually using the cloud. For example, if Scott were here, I'd point at Scott. Scott Beckett from AT&T, who has a global video services network, which is a completely private network. That hockey game that we showed was Rode, the AT&T global video services network. Right? Great stuff. Um, but nobody knows it's there. It's bigger than AT&T's cellular network, and nobody knows it's there. And you can use it, all right, to go in between clouds. Um, your external partners, so if you're into some kind of, you know, post-production work, how do they get there? How do they, how, how do they, how do they securely get there? Um, and most importantly, how do you measure your ROI? With that, I don't have any more slides. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you. So um, just to let everybody know, um, we, the Wi-Fi network in here uh, may be going off within the next five minutes or so. If you're depending on that, that's fine. I promise you the lights are staying on. Um, so now what we'd like to do is, um, first of all, um, I have a little presentation to make. Carl, could you uh, make your way up here? And uh, second of all, um, you stay here, John. Okay. Okay. And then uh, we're going to have a couple of minutes to uh, everybody, and we'll, you know, starting at 8 o'clock, we'll have an opportunity for everybody to come up, actually see this equipment. If you're good, Carl will let you touch it, but you've got, you got to go through Phil first. <laughs> okay. And um, we'll also uh, have an opportunity for you to you know, ask some uh, detailed questions and actually see how this stuff works. So